time for us to huddle up with senior producer from NFL Films, Greg Cosell, and talk X's and O's about this one, Steelers-Bills, 1 o'clock on Sunday. Greg, Bills are a little nicked up here. They may have to get creative uh, on both sides of the ball, quite frankly, with their play calling. Yeah, well, just before we start, Brownie, I just want to let you know, uh, I'm really liking that sweatshirt. I'm a, I'm a 2XL, by the way. You can send it okay. along anytime you want. <laughs> All right, we'll see what we can do. <laughs> we'll see what we can do. We'll get you in Bill's gear. Don't 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 there tease us like that, Greg. You know, I got to be an honorary member of Bill's Mafia. There you yeah, go. If you if you're gonna wear it, you got to wear it on the NFL matchup, though. That's all there is to it. Uh, <laughs> they, they make me wear they make me wear a coat and tie, Steve. I I, I don't control that. Just have the hood sticking out the back of the collar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, I know you're. But but you're right. A lot of injuries. I mean, I saw Ployer is out. Um, yep. Edmonds, I'm sure, will be out. Hamstrings don't don't heal in a week. Um, so, uh, Knox is out, you know, it, 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 it'll be interesting. I mean, obviously they just, they're coming off a big, big win and we can talk about that momentarily, but you know, and Pittsburgh in the minds of many probably doesn't seem like a very good team right now, but you know, you never know. That's, that's why we play them. And, and it's a big game because of what, of the game next week, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to go into the chiefs game, uh, you know, uh, with a law coming off a loss. Yeah. And this Steelers team kind of becomes a little bit of an unknown with Kenny Pickett in there. You saw him yep. play the second half against the the Jets. Got him a, actually got them a two a, a 10 point lead in the fourth quarter of that game and you know the Jets came back and and managed to win it, but Kenny Pickett I, and I'll say this. I'm like any casual fan, even a Pittsburgh fan. You loved what you saw in the preseason, his ability to extend plays, got a live arm, uh, didn't seem too big for him and I saw more nope. of that in in the in the jet game there was only maybe yeah he tried to fit the ball into some places but a couple of those interceptions were just bad hops and bad tips but i thought i liked oh, what he yeah. saw what i saw yeah i would i wouldn't those interceptions only only the second one was right. one that i think required some coaching because what he did steve and you know this that you can't do in the nfl you can't drift backward when you feel pressure and that's what he did on the second interception but the play we just saw, the shot he took, and he stood and delivered, and that was right in front of him, and he never flinched. He didn't even lose his technique throwing that ball. He's got mobility. The other thing that really stood out to me, and, and this is what you have to do in the league, is he threw to the one-on-ones. That was not a problem for him. You know you know as well as I do, when a lot of quarterbacks come into the NFL, and here's an example of throwing to the one-on-ones, um, you know, a lot of quarterbacks are used to throwing to receivers who are open in college football, and they have to learn that if it's one on one, even if your receiver appears to be covered, you have to make those throws in this league. And he I think he has an innate sense of that. Uh, and, and as I'm sure you guys do know, he played in college under Mark Whipple at Pitt. And that was an NFL offense because Mark Whipple had been in the league with several teams. Taking it a step further with their offense, you know, going forward, Greg, I, I'm, I'm anticipating that their approach will remain to a great degree the same. Um, I was kind of taken by their use of 12 personnel. Fryermuth is obviously, a, a, I like him a lot. He's a good player. Yeah. Um, I was trying to figure out their aim and approach when they do go to 12 personnel. I'm I'm kind of caught in the middle as to whether it's a byproduct of protection issues or their desire to run the ball, maybe even more so now with a rookie at quarterback to help support it. Yeah, I mean, I think ultimately they want to be a running football team. I mean, you talk about 12 personnel. Um, they, they did play over 30% of their snaps last week in 12 personnel. And, you know, my sense is that they want – look, even even when they named Trubisky the starter, you know with Trubisky as your starting quarterback that you're not coming out and throwing it around. You know that you're working off the run game. You want play action. You want boot action. You, you know you want to do those things. I don't think that mentality will change, Brownie, this Sunday. The okay. problem is they're not that good a running team. Um, yeah. I, I may be in the minority uh, – and, and this is all film study, but I went back this summer and I watched seven games of Najee Harris. And I got to tell you, I think Najee Harris is kind of a pedestrian NFL back. He's big, he's powerful, 
but he doesn't have any juice. Um, he can't. I had a great conversation with Fred Taylor at the Combine about five years ago, and he gave me a phrase that I use now when I evaluate backs, and that's the ability to re-accelerate in confined space. And Najee Harris can't do that. Right. So he's yes. essentially a grinder. So that right, listen, game, Greg, that, I got to tell you, I'm I I'm, I got to let Brent, Brownie's been hammering me about Najee Harris. G- give him the stats so you can so get it off your chest. We were taught when, when we do draft <laughs> prep and stuff, as I know you do, you watch a ton of tape, I was blown away by this one statistic, and I cannot remember the scout that un- unearthed it or draft guru that unearthed it. But in Najee Harris's, I don't know, 500-plus carries in college, only six, I think, went for 40 yards or more. You said 25 yards. Or 25 yards or more. So for me... Getting to the NFL, that means when he's trying to hit the hole, it's got to be a defined hole if he's going to get through it because he doesn't. He's no Fred Taylor that's going to no, get through no. a crease and go seven or eight yards or maybe the distance. No. He's need, he needs a defined hole that's that's got good integrity if he's going to get you somewhere between four and eight yards on that play. And this line, Greg, at least in my estimation, just flat out isn't good enough to do that for him. No, it's not a great O-line. And, of course, a lot of people say, well, gee, if he played behind a good O-line. Well, I think I think the point is if most backs played behind a really good yeah. O-line, they'd probably gain yards. I mean, that's, you know, I was a baseball player, and that's like saying in baseball that anybody can catch the good hops. You know, I mean, right. I, I think I think Najee Harris is is a powerful, physical, competitive grinder. There's no real explosive big play element to his running style. Um, you know, so again, he's not a bad back, but I'm not sure he's a true foundation back that you can lean on as a 20 carry, a, a, a game guy. So, you know, I, I don't think based on what I've seen on tape that he's that guy. And this is a team that's coming in and you're right. What do they hang their hat on? I mean, what are they, if this game, if they come in, play their game and beat the Buffalo bills, what's it going to look like? Well, I think it would have to look like some explosive plays in the passing game on the outside because their passing game is kind of vertical routes and short routes. They have not shown unless now with Pickett that changes. Um, I think he'll make throws that Trubisky might not make. And when I say make, I mean attempt. Um, right. You know, I think that when you've watched them the last couple of years when they had Big Ben, it was either vertical balls outside the numbers or they threw short balls. So, and it hasn't really changed much up to this point. So we'll see if they expand some of the concepts. Everybody has the concepts in their playbook, guys. You know that. It's what you choose to call. But Pickett, I think, is a more aggressive thrower. Um, and I think, look, at the end of the game, and that was, we saw the highlight, that was at the very end of the game when he threw the dig ball. But you don't see those kinds of throws very much in the Steelers' offense. What about on the defensive side? I, I uncovered this number, Greg, and it surprised me a little bit. Um, but I think I have a hunch as to why it is so. Steelers are fourth in the NFL in single high safety snaps. They have 51% yeah. of their snaps in single high safety. And I'm guessing that's partially due to the caliber of quarterbacks they faced. Burrow is probably the only top tier guy they faced. Otherwise, it's Brissett, Zach Wilson, and Mac Jones. So how much do you attribute who they have played a quarterback to playing so much single safety high? Because I, I think that's suicide against Josh Allen if you're playing it that often. Well, that's what we don't know um, because it's only been four games. So we don't know if that's what they worked on all through OTAs and training camp, and that's what they want their coverage foundation to be, or if that's the a case of, of who they played, Brownie, as you suggested. So that's a hard question to answer. Um, but the thing that's really interesting is is they have not gotten what they expected from Devin Bush, the linebacker. He was drafted high with the expectation that he's a great athlete and would be a three-down player. And while they do, they play him in base, they play him in some nickel, not all, and they do not play him in dime. So they all, they end up playing in their pass nickel, they play Spillane and Jack. And in their dime, they play Spillane. Now they play huh. some three they play 
some three to six dime as well, where they play both uh, Spillane and Jack, but they, they do not play Bush in their pass defense. I want to ask you about the Bills defense. They have allowed one touchdown in four games in the second half. Is there something is there something in that, uh, or is that just kind of a function of the way the games fell and it's just a, a luck of the draw, or is there something to that? Well, I, I think there's something to it. You know, it's funny. I watch I watch them play against the Ravens really carefully, and and not because of the Lamar factor running, just the coverage and. I think they do such a great job of in zone and and hear me out. I hope this is clear in zone, it, depending on how you play it, you can kind of force the quarterback to throw the ball where you want him to throw it. And by that, I mean, let's say you decide with your, your, your flat defender that you want him to get a lot of depth. So you're going to force the quarterback quarterback to throw the ball in the flat. You know, so they do a really good job with that. And, you know, it comes down to it's that's one reason I think they don't give up big plays, because the approach is, do you want the ball to go behind you or in front of you if you're an underneath defender? And in an ideal world, particularly, I mean, they didn't have the lead this week, but very often they play with a lead. You know, if you're playing with a lead, you want the ball to go in front of you, not behind you. And I think you can dictate that by how you drop, how you play with your eyes. You know, and they do a really, really good job of that. Uh, one thing that I wanted to discuss with you, Greg, was something that we discussed on our weekly podcast. Um, we, through the first four games, found that the Bills are sacrificing some explosiveness in the first half yes. in exchange for efficiency. And while their conversion rate on third down is still at the top of the league, they're forced to convert more of them because their passing game is focusing more on shorter passes, intermediate passes, than the explosives. As a result, though, what we found most interesting was their number of possessions are down in the first half from an average of about seven a game through the first month of the season last year to five this year. That's a big difference, yeah. Yeah, and as a result, they're not ahead on the scoreboard very often at halftime like they have been in the past. Their margin is zero at halftime through four games. And so while I want, I understand that's probably a byproduct of seeing a good amount of high cover two shell and just trying to take what they give them, um, it's kind of putting the pressure on them to pull away from teams in the second half. Now, their defense has been helping them a great deal in that. But I, I wonder if that is something that could rear its head in a bad way when they play a team like the Chiefs who can pile up points. Yeah. And it's a great point, Brownie, because I think one thing that's been missing has been the explosive plays. They've made a few, obviously, but I think I think that's something that they probably need to, to do more of. And I'm sure they know this. You know, if we're talking about it, they know it. Right. Um, but I think that that needs to happen because what you said is 100 percent true. I think the short passing game, for the most part, has taken the place of their run game. And that's another factor that at some point is going to be an issue if they don't do it more and better. But they're using the pass game essentially to be a run game. And Josh has become very efficient with those quick game throws. Uh, and that's that's great. That's, uh, you know, further part of his development into a great quarterback. But at some point, you're going to need to do two things. You're going to have to have a more conventional run game, and you're going to have to try to orchestrate and create big explosive plays in the pass game because it's hard to live like the way they're playing because, like you said, Brownie, the games are too close. Yeah, right. I want to ask you about maybe some specific players. This, uh, Khalil Shakir looks like he's elevating through the depth chart. He, he got a couple yeah. of plays last week, and with the injury, the unknowns to Isaiah McKenzie – uh, Gabe Davis has not been 100%, although it looks like he's improving. Crowder. He may be there. Crowder's out of the mix right now. Uh, Khalil Shakir may get elevated to, to quite a bit more playing time. In fact, he might be the next guy in under any circumstances this Sunday. Uh, compare, I mean, what do you think between, obviously, McKenzie's a fast guy and Khalil Shakir is not, you know, a speed merchant. What, how might those two guys, the inter interchange between, if McKenzie's out and Shakir's in, how does yeah. that change the offense? Um, well, I, I, 
I always feel watching tape that I feel like McKenzie's their their man to man guy. They use him a lot to run away from the defense, Steve. You know, you you've heard that for years. That's what they say versus man. You run away from man and you settle in, into voids versus zone. Um, McKenzie is that guy. We saw that last year against New England. We saw the great. I think it was. Um, was it the Miami game? What, what yeah. game did he did end of the 2020 he, season? Miami game, yeah, yeah. And they, but and also New England, year, I remember New Josh England game. Made a great throw yeah. to uh, to McKenzie. Oh um, yeah, that was week three. Beautiful throw. Was that week three where McKenzie yeah. was on the left sideline? Yeah, dropped it over his shoulder. Throw. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was man coverage. Um, McKenzie is is a man guy. I think Shakir. Not that he can't play against man, but I think you would see him more as a guy at this stage in his career. He's not necessarily going to do that as a, you know, he's not a speed merchant, but, you know, he got in last week. He had a big catch on, on the final drive where, um, you know, Josh moved to his left and Shakir found that, that void on the sideline. Um, and you guys know how I feel about him. We talked about him in the preseason a lot. And I said, at some point this season, he would get an opportunity. I mean, I would, you don't, you're not happy that guys are hurt for that to happen, but obviously that's the NFL. But I, I kind of like Shakir. I mean, I, I wouldn't surprise me if he gets meaningful snaps. I don't know if he'll be a volume target, but I think he'll get some meaningful snaps. Yeah, we, yeah. we talked to receivers coach here, Chad Hall, about him because for us, just watching him in training camp, he just seems to have a route savvy that is yep. wise beyond his years, especially for a fifth-round draft choice. And he's competitive. He's physical for his size. I mean, I really liked his tape coming out of college. Really like. I think here's the play where he he was yes. found the void on the sideline and uh, made the catch. You know, it was not a big gain, but it got him a first down in in a critical situation. Yeah, and those and this is the kind of thing that you know you don't know how these games are going to take place until they you know, actually happen. But with a, right. a rookie quarterback, I I don't think there's any question. I think the Pittsburgh offense is going to take. I think it's going to have an uptick with Kenny Pickett. I really do. I, and I like. I was wrong about how well Trubisky was going to play for them, but I think Pickett gives them some juice that Trubisky did not. And I think that's one thing the Bills have. I, I, turnovers are going to be an enormous part of this game. I believe if whichever team wins that has a better chance, has a the is going to win the game. I think, and that's the real thing that could help Pittsburgh. Their defense is good at getting turnovers, and if they do that, this game goes in the, the way their way. Yeah, you know, and, and it'll be interesting. You know, the Steelers, Highsmith has proven to be a pretty solid pass rusher. I think they're kind of trying to figure out who the other guy is opposite him uh, with with Watt out. But Highsmith has proven to be a pretty solid pass rusher. Um, you know, they played a lot of man. I'll be real curious what this what the Bills do in, with their receiver location because Mallette plays in the slot. Yeah. And, I think if you're going to play a lot of man, I think he's a guy worth going after. And, and you know, you could line Diggs up in there. Diggs doesn't always have to line up outside. I mean, you can line up receivers anywhere you want, especially for a team that plays a lot of man, because you can you can dictate the matchup you want. Right. Yeah, the one last thing about the defense before we let you go, Greg, for the Steelers anyway, we know they're without Watt. They're still trying to figure things out. I did see a statistic that said when Watt is not in the lineup, they blitz four times as often, understandably. Yeah. Understandably why. Blitzing Josh, though, sometimes can be foolhardy, as he has proven in the past. But you have a nicked-up secondary in the back. So they might have all their guys out there, but I don't know if any of them are going to be 100%. I'm wondering how much they try to help protect those guys on the back end with their front in terms of their approach with pass rush. Yeah, any any thoughts? Question. Yeah, because even Minka Fitzpatrick Brown, he, I guess, is he's is he yeah. questionable at this point? I haven't seen the final listing, but he's been limited in practice all week. As has Cameron Sutton, as has Levi Wallace, as has Terrell Edmonds, who was in concussion protocol. Yeah, so I mean, they could be playing with backups, and then you have to be careful, you know, because don't forget, you don't have to play man behind pressure. There's multiple kinds of pressures, and you can play zone concepts behind it. Um, so we'll see. I mean, they played a lot of cover one, as you mentioned. They played a lot of one robber, um, which is a man concept where you take one of your safeties and you drop them into the middle, and the other safety is just a post safety. Um, so they've done a lot of that. The question is, if they're going to play backups, 
Will they do that? Now, obviously, playing backups in zone is not automatically a panacea either because there's a lot of communication and eye discipline that is required, and backups may not be able to you know, feel real comfortable doing that. Last one I've got for you, Greg. Um, it's, I guess it says a lot that because there's so many things on the front burner, we've kind of stopped talking about the young corners of the Buffalo Bills, Kyrie Elam, yeah. Christian Benford, and that, you know Dane Jackson as well. Um, but Elam seems to be getting better, even in, even though you know he was playing behind Christian Benford, um, and of course Taron Johnson continues to play at a at an elite really level really with well. the slot. Yeah, really so. Well. Yeah. Give me an idea of, of what your thoughts are about Elam and how he's playing and also Dane Jackson and the fact that he was back in the lineup. Yeah, I mean, I thought they played well this week, but it's not a good test because, as you guys know, the Ravens, they play the fewest snaps of 11 personnel in the league. Less right. than 10% of their offensive snaps come with three wide receivers. I think all season long, they play 22 snaps with three wide receivers. So they'll get a bigger test this week, but I did watch – watched him a little bit when I watched that tape and I thought that Elam was pretty sticky in his coverage. I watched him a little more than Jackson. I've been impressed with Hamlin at safety. I don't know about you guys and I don't know what the coaching staff has said publicly, but I've been pretty impressed with Hamlin. Um, yeah. He, he's really good playing downhill. He's aggressive. While they're not a heavy blitz team by any stretch, as you guys know, when they do, sometimes he's a part of it. You know, I, I think he's played, to, to my eye, without knowing what he's asked to do on every play, I think he's played well. Yeah, Leslie Frazier was asked about that this week, and his description of Hamlin and Jaquan Johnson was as follows, because people are asking why did Hamlin start over Johnson, Johnson's been here longer, et cetera, et cetera. It's very clear that Leslie Frazier feels that Hamlin's strength is coverage, that he can cover the deep half. He has the range to do that and also plays with physicality on the back end while they feel Jaquan Johnson is better closer to the line of scrimmage. So I would anticipate that Johnson is going to take Poyer's spot while Hamlin stays in the back, you know, Manning Hyde's role, even though those two guys are usually interchangeable. I, how interchangeable right. these two are, I do not know. Yeah, and that could be game specific, which we don't know because we haven't seen them enough to know that. The coaching staff obviously has a feeling about that, but but all, but Hamlin did, did flash to me on film this week in particular. All right. Um, Thanks, Greg. As always, we appreciate it, and we'll catch up with you next week for week six. It's a big one. Thanks, Greg. I know. I'm, I'm looking for – I think I'll need my sweatshirt by then, Brownie. <laughs> okay, we'll, see, <laughs> we'll see how well the mail works. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thank you. <laughs>